our speaker today is Dr. Gregory Wibrat. So here is a general introduction of him. As Dr. Gregory Wibrat is pastor of Lake Avenue Church, a 119 year old congregation with over 4,000 members and over 5,000 attendees in Pasadena, California, where he has served since 2007. Prior to his pastoral service in Pasadena, Dr. Wibrat was president of Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois. He assumed his position on September 1, 1995. Before assuming the university presidency at Trinity, Dr. Wibrat had been pastor of Arlington Heights Evangelical Free Church in Arlington Heights, Illinois. In his 20 years as a pastor, he has also served as senior pastor of Grace Bible Church in Aloy Grant, California, and the assistant pastor of Gallery Memorial Church in Rising, Wisconsin. So let's welcome our guest, Dr. Rick Wright. Well, thank you for that wonderful uh, welcome. And I'm glad to be back at the Logos Seminary. Thank you to your president and chancellor and to anyone who was involved in uh, inviting me to come. I always enjoy being here. I, I usually feel at home uh, because uh, there are a few of you who have shown up at the church at Lake Avenue Church uh, in, in Pasadena. And if you haven't been there, I hope that you'll come and visit us. Uh, the other thing that makes me feel at home is that I think we have a number of faculty members who are graduates of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. I see some of the faces of people who studied there when I was the president there, and it makes me very, very happy to, to see you and to be here with you. I, I also enjoy being with people who are studying to go into the ministry. You sing so well, and, and, and there's such a joy that comes when I hear faculty members and graduate students singing so simply, Jesus loves me, this I know. <laughs> that is at the heart of everything that makes us sing. And with all of the studies that you're going to have and all the theology and history that you're going to learn and all of the practical work that you will be developing skills to do, I pray it will all flow out of deeply experiencing that, that Jesus loves you and that you know it from the depths of your heart, and that's what, what I really want to talk to you about today. Uh, I, I've thought about some of the uh, people who were at Trinity when I was there. When I was the president of the seminary, there was a time in our country when we went through a very challenging time, and we always do, but that time became well known. That was September 11th, 2001 when uh, the Twin Towers in New York were, were destroyed by, by the terrorist attack. After that had happened, we were going to be having a commencement, a graduation uh, at our school. And at that particular time, I had another friend who was a president of a school say to me, uh, Dr. Waybright, will you take a few moments and pray diligently about this question? If you have but one thing that you would pray for your students, what would that one thing be? Uh, there are many things that we pray for one another. And I thought about our students there at Trinity. We, we had students who had come from all over the world. And when they were going to be graduating, they would be going back into many of the most difficult parts of the world, where Christians are often persecuted, into Muslim countries, in, into places that are very difficult for the good news of Jesus even to go in, such as you've been praying about today in Kazakhstan. I thought about that, and I thought, what is the most important thing for us to know if we're going to be faithful to Jesus, and that whatever we face, that we'll continue to have not only the willingness to continue serving Jesus and carrying the gospel to the world, but a deep joy in doing so. And of the many, many things that I thought about that I'd like to pray for, for the students who were there, there was one verse, or actually a couple of verses in the Bible, that became the very heart of my prayer for our students. So for the rest of my time at Trinity, 
And now that I'm a pastor here at Lake Avenue Church, what I prayed for for my students there, that's the same thing I pray for for the people of our church. And I pray that they'll experience it in our church. And I want you to know today that this is my pastor's prayer for you as well. Uh, during your studies, uh, during the time that will come afterwards, whatever you may face uh, in your families, in your marriages, uh, in your finances, that somehow this truth that the Apostle Paul prayed for in Ephesians chapter 3 might be something that you find to be true in your own experience. Here's the prayer that I prayed. It's in Ephesians chapter 3, verses uh, 17, the second part, all the way to verse 19. Here is my prayer for our students, my prayer for you today. The Apostle Paul said, I pray that you, uh, you who have been rooted and established in love, I pray that you may have power, power to grasp and power to know the love that goes beyond all understanding, power to grasp together with all God's people how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And I pray that you will know that love that goes beyond knowing so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Do we, we have this here in front of you. This is my prayer for you. So let's keep that in front of you for just a moment. And let me ask you the question, what am I praying for when I pray that for you? What was the Apostle Paul praying for when he prayed it for the people in Ephesus? And if you look at the prayer, you'll see it's a prayer for power. I pray that you may have power. And so often I felt when we pray for one another and when we pray for ourselves, we pray that God will give us power. Power to remember what we've studied so that we can reproduce it on a test. So sometimes when we haven't studied enough, pray, praying for power to have something in our minds that we've never put in there in the first place. Sometimes when we pray for one another, we pray that we'll have power to be able to, to do miracles, uh, power to be able to have the courage to tell other people about Jesus. Uh, we pray sometimes that we will have power even that uh, we might be able to show the love of God much more than we ever have. We pray for power almost every time we pray. But the thing I want you to see about this prayer is that it's not the way we usually pray about power. It's not prayer that I can, power that I can do more. It's not even prayer that I can love God more. Do you see what the Apostle Paul says? I pray that you will have power to grasp and to know how much God loves you. Now, now, now brothers and sisters, when you get to Ephesians chapters 4 through 6, the Apostle Paul talks about having the power to live for God and, and the power to love other people more. But he knows that in the Christian faith, it doesn't start with what we do. And one of the things I never, ever want you to forget is that our Christian faith is different from other religions. And basically it's because of this. Our Christian faith is a response to what God has done. It is not me having enough power that I can earn my way that God might love me more. It is a response to a love that goes beyond anything we could ever, ever understand. Do you see that? The Christian faith is such a beautiful thing. The good news is this. You and I have all fallen short of what God has made us to be, and we know it. Every person that we'll ever serve as a pastor or as a missionary will have fallen short of everything that God has made them to be, and God knows it, and you and I will know it. And yet the amazing good news of the Bible is the God who made the world, the holy God who is perfect in every way, loves people who are made in his image. And he loves you. And I want you in your ministry always to be able to rest in that and find joy in that. Notice what he says. There are two pieces of it. I pray you'll have power, two things, to grasp 
the love of God and to know the love of God. Uh, these are two related things, but very different things. Uh, first, I pray that you'll have the power to grasp the love of God. The word that he uses there is for something that happens in our minds. It has to do with our understanding of what God has said. And one of the reasons why in a seminary you take time to come and study is so that you can see what God has said about the world, about what's gone wrong with the world, about us. And one of the things that you will find when you continue to read through the Bible is that you will continuously see that in spite of the fact that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that we can truly sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. We need power to grasp what God has said about himself. He's revealed so much about himself, and in your theology classes, you're going to be able to have the privilege here at Logos to just bask in the beauty of what God has revealed about himself and understand it well enough, I pray, that you'll be able to pass it on to this world. But one of the things that stands at the heart of what God has revealed about himself is that he is love and that he loves the people of the world in spite of our sins. We need power to grasp, but amazingly, uh, the Apostle Paul won't leave that with something just being in our heads. And this is an issue in a seminary. So many times we can have all the truth about God in our minds, but it hasn't made its way from its, our minds into the rest of our beings. And so he uses this second word, not only the power to grasp, but the power to know. This is a word of experience. This is a word that takes what, what God has said about himself and says, God, you are speaking the truth. I believe it. And Lord, may I not only have this in my mind, but may I experience this in the depths of my being so that all that I am and all that I do flows out of my experience of your love in my life. You see, the Apostle Paul, who considered himself the worst of all sinners, you know, even at the end of his ministry, he would be saying that. I am the chief of all sinners. He said, this is a good truth to know, that Jesus came, Christ came for people like me, sinners of whom I am the worst. He who felt that way also knew that the God who knew that about him loved him with an everlasting love. And so do you notice in this prayer, he found it hard to even describe it. He said, it goes beyond all the dimensions we can ever imagine. I, I pray that you'll have power to grasp and know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that love. J just think about that, how wide the love of Christ is. It, it's wide enough to embrace all the people groups of this world. And in the book of Ephesians, when you read it, the question was, did God's love, was it big enough, wide enough to embrace both the Jew and the Gentile? <laughs> because that's what was going on in the book of, of Ephesians. The Jew and the Gentile had come to God through faith in Jesus, but they didn't want to come together into one family. <laughs> and, the, and the Apostle Paul says, but God loves both. And he loves you, and when he brings you, he brings you into one family. So that's what makes you and me brothers. And sisters. It is wide enough to reach... Uh, Young and old, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, and here I just think in the United States, Republican and Democrat. It's just an amazing thing. That is the love of God. It's available for all. It is long. It is long enough to last forever. Even though other loves may not last, the love of God does. It is high. It is high enough to take imperfect people like us all the way to God, all the way to heaven. It is deep. It is deep enough to reach down into wherever we are in our lives. You know I'm pastoring over in Pasadena. It's a beautiful city. And yet just to the northwest of our church, it's one of the most gang-dominated uh, uh, areas of all of Los Angeles County. And you, I don't know if you know, Lake Avenue Church has been very involved in trying to help kids get out of gangs, trying to help people who are homeless to find uh, freedom there, to help, help the people who are trapped or addicted to drugs 
to find the liberating power of Jesus to be real. And this is something I hold on to, no matter how far a person has drifted away from the way that God would have us to live. The love of God is deep enough to reach down into our lives and then to lift us up into that beautiful place of knowing that we belong to him. And so, so the thing I want you to see is that before the Apostle Paul ever stops to talk about how we're supposed to live, which is what Ephesians 4 through 6 is all about, he stops to pray that people would be able to have the power to grasp and to know how much God loves them because it's only when we grasp that and know that that we are so grateful that we go wherever he calls us to go and do whatever he calls us to do. Now, we need this power, we know, for obvious reasons. I, I remember thinking about this with the students at Trinity. I was meeting with our student government, our, our main leaders, and some of them were sharing with me the areas of their life that were not yet all that God would have them to be. And many of them had come from homes where their families expected them to be absolutely perfect. I, I don't know if any of you know that, but they had experienced that, and yet they knew they were not. They knew where they had fallen short. And they said, President Waybright, how is it possible that we can know that God loves us when sometimes we don't even know how on earth we could ever love anything about ourselves because we have fallen short? And, and I said, you need power. You need the power to grasp a love that is greater than anything you could know in this world. It is a love that he, even, Paul even says, it goes beyond our human knowing. But once we have met Jesus and he enters into our lives and we experience the love of God, it sets us free. So my brothers and sisters, that's, that's my first thing I want to say to, today. What this prayer is about is about power. Power to grasp and know something that this world doesn't usually see or experience. Power to grasp and to know that the God who made the universe sent his one and only son out of love for you and me. And that's why I don't know who picked out that song, but that's why Jesus loves me. This I know stands at the heart of us actually living for the Jesus who loved us so much that he gave his life for us. Hallelujah. Okay. Second question about this. That, that's what the prayer is. So why, of all the things I might pray for or you might pray for, would we pray this prayer? And the phrase at the end of this prayer, found in verse 19, is one I also don't want you to miss. And the phrase is this, I pray this so that, and here comes this unfathomable, beautiful phrase, so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I pray this so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Don't you think that's a beautiful phrase? Do you fully understand what it's talking about? I don't think I do. <laughs> But I can, I can get us as far as, I can take you as far as I think I can go. There's all this beautiful language in the Bible that talks about the fact that what God is doing in this world is he's taking the things that have, are not what they should be. Ever since Genesis 3, ever since into this perfect world where everything was good, sin entered into this world and it messed up everything in this world, God has said, I have a mission. And in this mission, when I am done with it, everything in the universe will be made new. Everything will be the way that it's supposed to be. No more sin. No more pain. No more debt. No more death. All will be the way God wants it to be. And the beautiful thing is that includes you and me. Th that's what this is talking about. We were made in the image of God. We were made to reflect the very nature of our Father in whose image we were made. We fall short. And anybody say Amen. <laughs> We fall short of what God would have us to be. But the promise is those things that have made it so that we fall short where we have walked away from God through the death of Jesus can find cleansing and through the power of the Holy Spirit 
will end up in our remaking. Sometimes the phrase, like in Romans chapter 8, will be that you and I are promised that we're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, we are told we're going to be complete in Christ. And here, in this beautiful, beautiful verse, he says, you and I are going to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's our destiny. That, that's why God gives his spirit to us. When we are done, we'll be glorified. We'll reflect the very nature of the one in whose image we are made. Uh, I use a, an illustration for this. I, talk, I preach about this all the time at Lake. Any of you who show up, you know, this matter of what God is doing in this world and he'll do in our lives so that we can go out into our hurting world and say there's still hope. There's hope for all because of the love of Jesus. The illustration that I use was given to me by my son, who is an artist. And he told me about a movement in art called reclamation art, uh, taking things that are destroyed, reclaiming them, and remaking them. And what happens with the reclamation art movement is that they often go into places in the world where things have been devastated by pollution, or by, by, by the effects of industry, and go in and take places that have become ugly in, in, in the world and begin to make beautiful things out of them. Let me just show you one illustration. I think I have pictures of it. Um, if we can show the first one. All right. This comes from near my home. I grew up in a little town in West Virginia. Uh, this is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you look at that picture, you may find it hard to admit, imagine that that area at one time was one of the most beautiful parts of the United States. It's the Nine Mile Run District of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh, if you don't know, is a place where many of the steel mills are here in the United States. So in the steel mills, they just let the slag, it's called, all the waste from the steel industry was dumped. And for some reason, in 1950, the city decided that the place where they would dump all the waste from the steel mills was in the Nine Mile Run District. It had been so beautiful, it had a stream running right down through the middle of it. And by the time they were done, well, it looked like this or worse. The stream itself was so polluted that it hardly flowed at all. At that time, three artists had a project that they decided that they wanted to enter into that and make something beautiful out of it. Um, they drew together from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, uh, botanists, uh, engineers, uh, architects, people from many, many disciplines, and they began to work. What they wanted to do was this, though. They didn't want to destroy what was there. They wanted to enter in and remake it. They didn't want to do just a, a partial job. They wanted to do a complete transformation. Anybody who was going to be involved in the project couldn't do it from a distance, but actually had to roll up the sleeves and go into the ugliness of all of the pollution that was there. And now if you will go back to the Nine Mile areas, I have a picture of what it's turned into. That's yeah, what it looks like now. Brothers and sisters, that's what God's doing in your life and in mine. He doesn't destroy us, he loves us. He takes what is there and begins to remake it. And when he's gonna be done, it's gonna be beautiful. We'll be complete in Christ. And this is the message you and I have to take out into our world. So we don't go out into our world with a, this hopeless spirit of saying, isn't everything terrible out here? We see that things are terrible, but we see through the eyes of Christ. We are to love the people of this world, love the world that God has made, and enter in with the gospel, calling people to Jesus and when he is done with people's lives, they will be beautiful again. Brothers and sisters, when he's done with you and me, we'll be what he created us to be. Why pray this prayer? Because that will never happen unless we have experienced the love of God. Uh, psychologists know this, uh, that people who are having psychological disorders can almost never find healing unless they've experienced some place in which they've experienced unconditional love. Now in our world, and you heard it about Kazakhstan, with so many broken families and single families and orphaned children, 
not only there, but here in our own United States and all around the world, with families broken and fragmented, where are people going to experience any context of unconditional love? I'll tell you, this is a part of why God has called you and me into places of being pastors and gospel bearers and missionaries, because he plants families of people, local churches, in communities where people have never experienced the love of God, any kind of unconditional love. And he says, be a family. And within that context, people can experience how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ so that they may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Do you see this? This is good news. This is what gives me hope, and you as well. This is what we have to carry into the world. Let me just ask one last question, and then let me see how I'm doing. Oh, not as bad as I thought. Uh, third, how do you experience this kind of pray uh, prayer? How will God answer this prayer? If, if I pray for you and you pray for your people, that they will experience the depth of the love of God, H how will God answer that? Well, I guess the first answer to that question is that God is God and he can do it however he wants. <laughs> and God does show his love in countless ways. I, I hope you've experienced it in some of those unexpected ways. I surely have. Sometimes in the most difficult times of my life, God has sent just the right person to provide for the needs or to give a word of encouragement. And at the end of that time, I thought, God knows me, God loves me, and he sent me a... Sp Have you ever had that happen in your life? In the book of Revelation, in, to the church in Pergamum, it, it's what was called that unexpected manna. It wasn't there one day, <laughs> the next day it was there. Uh, that's those unexpected ways that God makes his love known to you. So he can answer it any way he knows. How else, how else will people grasp and know how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is? Oh, some, some of it is in that word grasp. Um, if we'll take time to read what God says, one of the things we'll find that he keeps saying is, I love you. I love you so much I sent my one and only son. Jesus, I love you so much I'm willing to die in your place and bear your sins. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever, uh, maybe this is mostly uh, uh, American-born uh, uh, sorts of, of, of families, but sometimes in our marriages, uh, men don't express their love well enough. And so often, whenever I've had people, when I've been counseling them as their pastor, I'll have the, uh, the wife and the husband come in, and I'll say, what's, what's the problem? And, and sometimes the wife will say to me, Pastor, he never tells me ever that he loves me. And uh, sometimes, and really this happened one time, the, the husband, I turned to him, they'd been married 20 years. I said, don't you? He said, well, I told her 20 years ago. If I change my mind, I'll let her know. <laughs> well, well, let me tell you, sometimes don't we need people actually to tell us? And I'll tell you, that's one of the things I love about taking the time regularly to be in God's word because I see him in countless ways telling me, I am the maker of the universe, but I am the lover of your soul. And uh, never forget, and I will tell you again and again, I love you with an everlasting love. And the love that you experience in Christ, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that's the second way. But... And here we go, to those of you especially who are leading churches, involved in churches, and I hope that's every one of you. <laughs> Where will people experience the love of God? And I want you to look at that verse one more time. Um, and at that phrase, you have been rooted and established in love. What he's talking about there in the book of Philippians is that God had had an eternal plan in the midst of a broken world to plant families, an eternal family, an unexpected family made up of all people who are committed to one another in Christ. We, where we still have all the differences that we have as human beings that God has created, some tall, some short, uh, uh, some Chinese-speaking, some English-speaking, 
uh, all sorts of, all the diversity and breadth of our father's family, but now all brought into one family and bowing, as he says in Ephesians 3.14, the knee before our one father in heaven, brothers and sisters in Christ. So he said, uh, I am going to be planting in a world where people don't know me and are broken from my love, my family, and we are to reflect his glory. You have been rooted when you place your faith in Jesus. It's not just a relationship between you and God. You are brought into a global family where you experience the love of Jesus. Do you remember when the rich young ruler was asked to leave everything behind in Mark chapter 10? How was he going to survive if he gave up all of his goods that Jesus told him to do? Give everything you have away. Come follow me. He would have been destitute. How would he survive? Do you remember what Jesus said? But when you give your life to me, you'll have a hundredfold houses and lands and mothers. Do you think you'd want a hundredfold mothers? Well, Jesus said you will, <laughs> will have that. Well, do you see what he's saying? That the way that you often experience the love of God is that God plants in this world local churches where we, we must reflect the love of God to one another. And I, the phrase that he uses is not only you've been, when you believe in Jesus, you're rooted and established in the loving family, the local church, but you also then, you experience God's love together with all God's people. Do you see that in the phrase? Together with all God's people. When you come together across those things that usually divide our world and find oneness in Christ, worshiping God together, serving one another, loving one another, you experience within the context of the church the love of God. Now, the kinds of churches you pastor and that you lead can only become that with the help of God. And so many times our churches can be very com committed to the holiness of God, and we should be. But do you see, it's within the church that we must always, always pray for and proclaim this message that those who turn back to Christ can experience welcome and the love of Christ. As pastors, as leaders, we must declare the justice of God, but we at the same time must show the mercy of God. And we always must walk with humility alongside of God. And one of the things I believe that has kept many people who go to church from actually becoming uh, conformed to the image of Christ and complete in the Lord is that within the church we have so much focused on laws and rules and justice that we have not made sure that people know that there is always a path back to restoration through faith in Jesus. That when, when people turn back and say, I want to walk with the Lord, we will make sure that we find a way back again into the family. Are you with me when I say this? The kinds of churches we must have must always provide an opportunity for repentance, restoration, and remaking. In a world in which there is so much lovelessness and where we so quickly cut people off, the heart of the gospel is reconciliation. That our Father sent his one and only Son who shed his blood, Colossians chapter 1, to take things that are broken and to bring them back together. To take what's become hostile and to make peace. And all of that must be shown in our churches. All of that must be shown in our churches. Where will the people of this world ever be able to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ? I'll tell you, it, it can only be when you and I have experienced it ourselves, we proclaim with our mouths the message, God loves you with an everlasting love. And in our communities of faith centered on Jesus, our churches, we live out the demands of that gospel, namely always offering love to the one who comes back, always offering welcome to the one who comes home, because that's what God does. And sometimes people who still have to live by faith and not by sight wonder, is this really true? And they will know it is true when they see it within our churches. Sometimes when I think about that, 
I say this at our church so often. I say, to be that kind of a church, that doesn't come naturally to us as human beings. What it's going to take is the power that raised Jesus from the dead to make this happen among us. But in the book of Ephesians, we are told that that's exactly what we have. Oh, I could say so much more. Can you tell the burden that I have uh, for us, actually? I love to speak with seminary students because I know that God is going to use you. You have sensed God's call upon your life. You are here to train for that call. Uh, I, I, and so because of that, I want you to see a vision for what a church can be within the place where God is going to send you, wherever that may be. It is the place where the people in this broken world where everything is falling apart, can come together and experience the love of God within his people, among his people. And I pray that you might experience that and the churches that you might plant might be committed to that. And so I'll just end with this. Here's my prayer for you. If we can put it back up, this, this is my prayer for you. For you to plant those kinds of churches, lead those kinds of churches, rebuild those kinds of churches, you have to know it's true as well. So I pray that you may have power. I bow my knee before the Father. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all God's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And seminary students, I pray you may know that love that goes beyond human knowing. And I pray it so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I pray that because of and in the name of Jesus. Amen.